Uh, it, it turned out he had rejected uh, The Day Before the Revolution by Ursula Le Guin, which went on to, to win. I, believe me, Jacobson was a terrible editor. <laughs> Uh, but it, it went on to win the Nebula and possibly the Hugo as well that year. Uh, that was so. I Jim liked the fact I had a series. He didn't especially like the stories. He he said later that he didn't understand. But he he liked the notion of a series, and he liked the fact there were stories by somebody that he didn't have to rewrite massively as he did most of what was going into the books because Galaxy had a payment problem. So I did a number of other Hammer stories for him and of the ones I did he bought two and rejected two. And um, then when he became editor of the science fiction program at Ace Books he called Kirby and asked for, uh, my, my agent, and asked for a collection of the Hammer stories. I, I did not know this, but it turned out Kirby had been shopping the Hammer stories around and had gotten, I, I didn't know this, uh, I had gotten rejected by everybody. I didn't learn this until years later, my, my editor at Tor, uh, David Hartwell, uh, we were sitting at dinner, and I don't remember what we were chatting about. And I said something about, oh, I, I, it was, I think he said something about, uh, well, anything, if you do a military SF novel now, you'd have to have a co-educational army. And I said, David, I had that in the Hammer series back in 1973. You know, that... And he said, I want to apologize to you for rejecting. The, I, I wanted to buy them, but my boss wouldn't let me buy them, and I didn't go to the, the wall for it. And I, you know, I don't argue with editorial decisions. But Jim Bain made a different editorial decision. And all of a sudden, I became a military SF writer, <laughs> which wasn't anything I had set out to be. And the thing is, the hammer, hammer slammers in particular had such an impact that I, a lot of people thought, maybe think, uh, that that was what I wrote. It was never more than about a quarter of what I wrote, uh, deliberately, because I, I insisted on writing other stuff. Jim would have been really happy if I'd uh, just limited myself to Hammer stories, and I, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be completely forgotten now. But um, I did other stuff, and I continued to do other stuff, including fantasy. Um, and what I am doing now is primarily space opera, and like Mark, uh, space opera is a different thing. Uh, got a lot of similar aspects to it. But um, my space operas don't have nearly as sharp, harsh, perhaps, an edge as the, uh, the military SF does. And um, I like that in me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Jim Bain always, I, I would say the only time an army base or an army camp uh, isn't muddy is when it's dusty. And he'd been based, he, he had three years in the army, but he was based in Bavaria at a former Luftwaffe uh, barracks, and they had German hooch maids coming in to, uh, you know, take care of stuff. And the dollar was really high against the mark. And he, he thought of the army as being, you know, really an idyllic situation. <laughs> he couldn't fully understand my attitude. <laughs> he was a good guy. He died almost exactly two years ago.
I would always hoped he would be the one to buy my first professional story, but that wasn't to be. He would, however, tell me, you're not there yet. Keep trying. Yeah. Uh, the first is probably more important. Buying a piece of crap does not do anyone any favors. We're going to come back to Jim in just a minute, but you've given me a chance to ask about some of your other work, some of which I think will be of particular interest to a co-blogger. I will answer any question you ask. Some of your other work, you've actually rewritten some of the Norse sagas as science fiction. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, sure. Tell us a little bit about that. Oh, uh, that's... That was really, that was a stretch. Um, yes, we went to Iceland. Uh, you know, I took my family to Iceland and we actually toured completely around Iceland a few days here, you know, working around the island. Uh, got to really see the country. And while there, I got a, um, a complete good translation of the Elder Edda. The, uh, the verse Edda, which was actually published by the University of Texas. And <laughs> but, but I bought it in Reykjavik, <laughs> and I started reading that on the flight back. I was fascinated by it, and I got to thinking about... Now, understand, I'd, I'd always used um, myths, legends, and history as the bases of my fiction. That, that, that wasn't a change. Uh, I've rewritten the um, Odyssey. I rewrote the Argonautica. Uh, you know, I've, I've done this sort of thing repeatedly. Uh, I even, in, in a way, I didn't rewrite the Iliad, but what I did was take Horace's strictures on writing about Achilles in his Ars Poetica, and I, I turned that into a novel, military SF novel. Um, the Warrior, if you're wondering. Um, but as I was reading the, the various poems of the Elder Edda, it struck me that I could do a real mainstream science fiction, but unusual mainstream science fiction by treating the, the worlds and the situations of the, not the sagas, although they, they worked in also, but the, the actual Norse myths um, as science fiction. And so I, I had this sort of kicking around in my head. And an editor, t I didn't bounce it off Jim because I was pretty sure Jim would not be interested. But I thought this might be my chance to do some, you know, a breakout mainstream SF. And um, so an editor took me to breakfast and we chatted and it was a nice chat. And... Um, she was, this is Beth Fleischer, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful writer, uh, uh, editor rather, with Ace, uh, quit when her publisher screwed her over, basically. And uh, she's married to Chris Claremont, who was making well into six figures and decided she didn't need the hassle, which I'm sure she was right, but I miss her. Beth, if you hear this, I miss you. Uh, but uh, I got up to go, and she said, well, you know, if you ever have something you don't think is right for Jim Bain, and you'd like to see what a bigger house could do with it, um, come talk to me. And I thought, I, s I sat down, and uh, I said, if you're serious about this, 
I've got this idea for turning the Norse myths into science fiction. Uh, I am thinking of it as a trilogy, but I, I want to say right now that I, I think this could be a big thing. I want $100,000 for it. And she said, let me get this straight. Uh, that's $100,000 for the trilogy, not $100,000 a book. I said, yeah, that, that's right. And she said, I'll see what I can do. That's all the discussion there was. And two days after I was back from the convention, she phoned and said, uh, the publisher agreed to it. <laughs> so then I had to write it. <laughs> <laughs>